morning good afternoon and good evening hi we are lamark and the lead at global visa forum and director at mehdi bagh computers i am pleased to welcome everyone to this edition of eagerly awaited and highly acclaimed gbf series of webinars organized in association with satellite evolution and with the kind support of thraya thraya is one of the leading global mss service provider all i can say from my association with hadr is that thraya is always available with satellite phones communication systems and bandwidth for every disaster relief operations gbf sincerely thanks thraya for supporting and enabling this webinar so let us listen to our eminent experts and technology geeks who are highly experienced not only in the technology domain but also very passionate for hadr and have long standing experiences working in preparedness capacity building relief and reconstruction i introduce my industry colleagues and today's panelist mr simon gray from utilsat mr james kamel from inmarsat mr jasim nasir from thraya and mr steve haley from night sky but before we speak with them let me tell you today's topic is very dear to me personally for we are glad in putting to use leveraging technology and connectivity towards saving human lives i am sure all panelists as well as attendees agree with me this is one key driver for us at gbf2 to be consistently engaged supporting disaster mitigation efforts which starts from disaster preparedness disaster relief right up to rehabilitation and reconstruction phase with environmental changes and impact of industrialization the frequency of natural disasters year over year has increased multifold at present two to three major incidences with vast magnitude and a number of small natural disasters happen worldwide epidemics and pandemics further complicates these challenges which is additional to man made situation all this leads to large population getting impacted globally extending relief in time and at the right place to the affected population is very crucial therefore knowing the realities on the ground is essential let's take an example of an earthquake or a tsunami when a disaster strikes people move away from the epicenter for saving lives local communication infrastructure is mostly destroyed fiber telecom cables power cables get snapped mobile towers are dysfunctional and the networks are down at the same time government institutions military un agencies ngos prepare deployments for the first responders and relief teams knowing ground reality is necessary need of the hour is to look at the affected geography this information is key to plan relief operations which is mainly achieved via satellite imagery from connectivity standpoint satcom remains the most practical robust and preferred solution first responders are usually equipped with satellite phones for quick deploy man pack terminals along with solar gensets as the response and relief moves forward maximizing last mile reach becomes the need of the hour augmenting communication by deploying drones to creating wifi zones to enabling small cells and multiple hybrid solutions are set up and energized with backhaul over satcom rapid relief operations then only commences so let us listen to our eminent experts and technology geeks who are highly experienced 
not only in their technology domain, but also very passionate for HADR and have long standing experience working in preparedness, capacity building, relief and reconstruction. I introduce my industry colleagues and today's panelists. So Simon, please say something about yourself. So um, I'm Simon Gray, I'm a senior vice president at Udelsat for civil government. Uh, I was also on the ITU advisory board for devising a strategy for disaster relief communications for ITU member countries. Um, and I represent the satellite industry um, as part of the GVF board on the emergency telecommunications cluster. Um, this cluster you'll hear about later on, but it's basically all NGOs and large UN agencies that deal with disaster relief communications. Um, I've been involved in, in, in helping the, the humanitarian sector since 2004. Um, and in um, 2016, I was voted by the other nine or eight signatories of the Crisis Connectivity Charter to coordinate the negotiations between the UN and the satellite industry until it was signed into operations in 2018. So there we go. And James, can you share your background? Uh, yes, thank you. So my name is James Kemmel. I'm Vice President of Inmarsat in charge of government relations. Uh, relevant to this theme, several years ago, I set up a number of humanitarian programs uh, in partnership with different governments around the world, one of which was on disaster response, which won a, 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 an IT, ITU World Summit in the Information Society uh, Award um, for it. Also relevant to this earlier on, in my career, I spent some time in the NGO world and have a, a, a master's degree in international development. Thank you. And Jason, can you tell us about yourself? Thank you, Riyaz. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Jasim Nasser. I've been with uh, Freya now uh, over uh, 20 years, and I'm the chief strategy uh, and marketing officer there. Uh, I look after the uh, strategy function, business development, market development, and the product management. And uh, I've been fortunate uh, during my career with Raya to uh, work on the NGO sector and work with some of the NGOs. Uh, one of the uh, agreements that I worked on personally and directly was uh, the agreement with the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, between, with Raya. Uh, where we uh, signed up an agreement uh, to support the disaster relief operations by Thray providing uh, terminals uh, at no cost and also discounted uh, airtime to, to support the disaster relief uh, operations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve, we need to know about you as well. Thank you, Riaz. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Steve Haley. I work for uh, Night Sky. I've been on site at over 100 domestic and domestic and international disasters spanning the past 25 years, specializing in emergency telecommunications and disaster recovery. Um, following her came Maria. I responded providing vital disaster technology solutions and uh, to many agencies and organizations and was awarded the 2017 Humanitarian Award by Mission Critical Magazine for my work there in Puerto Rico. I'm humbled to work at Night Sky, located in Frederick, Maryland, in the US here, um, helping international, federal, state, and local customers with their uh, disaster technology needs. Uh, previous experience includes uh, responding to the 2010 Haiti earthquake uh, for the United Nations. I was the ETC coordinator supporting all the NGOs uh, on that uh, relief operation. And uh, prior to that, I worked for the American Red Cross national headquarters for 10 years. And while at the Red Cross, I responded to 9-11 in New York City, uh, Hurricane Katrina, and many, many other disasters to include aircraft accidents uh, with the uh, National Transportation Safety Board. And I reside outside of Washington, DC and volunteer my time on the side uh, as a volunteer firefighter in my local community. Thank you very much. This gives us a very fair picture on the 
experience which all my speakers have today more on the hdr side implementing technology so simon if you can tell us the satellite industry has crisis connectivity charter with the united nations wfp through the etc can you characterize this in terms of preparedness and its operational functionality also what is missing in disaster resilience plan at the moment okay um so i'll do a little introduction to the crisis connectivity charter in case people aren't aware of it um it was uh, the 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 world food program who heads the emergency telecommunications cluster came to us in 2015 and explained to the satellite industry because we we all met in in brussels um and they explained to the satellite industry that disasters as you say are getting more severe uh, they're lasting longer and they're getting more frequent and also as as Irma and Maria taught us they're hitting us twice so it's not only a one heavy punch it's two heavy punches coming in very short uh, spaces of time um so they 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 appreciated what the satellite industry had done up to that point because we'd all been improvising our own solutions but they said at this stage now we need to have predictable solutions we need to have predictable solutions that we can plan for um, and it needs to be, they asked for us to cover 20 countries as an industry. Well, we, we went away and we sat in a huddle um, and all of the usual suspects were there. Um, and we, we came back with a proposal where we said, well, satellite doesn't do really countries. Uh, satellite does continents, satellite does regions. Um, so we won't cover 20 countries, we'll cover 140 countries with uh, multiple satellite solutions, whether they be FSS for broadband or MSS for situational report. Um, and in the end, uh, um, the, the, the eight signatories um, voted me to coordinate it from 2016 to when it was signed into operations in 2018. The signatories, and I'm gonna read this from a screen because I don't wanna miss anybody. <laughs> Um, so it's Utilsat, uh, uh, um, SES, Inmarsat, Intelsat, Arabsat, Hisparsat, Turaya, um, Yarsat, and Global Eagle. And on the UN side, it is the World Food Programme and the ITU. Um, and the other organisations that signed it on behalf of the satellite industry is the GVF, of course, and the SOA. So all of those organizations got together um, and the satellite fleet operators agreed to donate equipment and to donate bandwidth for three months every time the charter is activated. So the charter has been activated three times uh, since 2018, uh, once in Mozambique, where, um, if I remember rightly, it was uh, Udalsat and Inmarsat that were activated, and then SES also came along to help. And then for Bahamas, Dorian, um, again, it was, uh, this time it was Hisparsat, Inmarsat, if I believe correctly, and also uh, Udalsat that were activated there. Um, and again, SES were activated as part of the uh, Luxembourg.lu uh, or emergency.lu. Um, and so therefore we have equipment stored in Dubai and Panama, logistics bases. So they're ready for deployment. Um, and yes, we, we, we give the World Food Programme a database of satellite solutions covering each country so that the World Food Programme simply says, okay, Mozambique, these people cover it. These are the solutions. Let's activate X and Y. They ring us. We say yes. Um, we have a small conference with the other operators to inform them what's happening. And uh, the other operators obviously have an opportunity to contribute if they think they can. And uh, then we, 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 we open the satellite circuits. Um, and the World Food Program normally installs our equipment for us. Um, we also do trainings around the world for ETC staff and other NGOs, etc. So that, in a nutshell, is is the crisis connectivity charter. Um, so and one, 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 with the NGOs. 
Yes. And one thing I want to say is that this is the first time an industrial sector like logistics or, or whoever, the satellite industry as an industrial sector has come forward together and committed support together. So this is a really proud moment for the satellite industry because we have shown how collegiate we are and how good we work together. So in this, you are giving equipments, you are giving bandwidths, as well as you're preparing the warm bodies to be ready to deploy and do those things. Yes, that's exactly it. That's good, that's good, wonderful. And uh, what do you suggest on disaster resilience plan at the moment? Where does it stand? Um, disaster resilience is a difficult one. Um, oh, I missed out one activation. We were activated uh, last year for Vanuatu, uh, which was in Marsat, which was Intelsat and in Marsat. So I forgot that one. Sorry about that. Um, so a disaster resilience. Um, I think that the moment has come for the satellite industry to be ready to supply, be part of disaster resilience um, and supply connectivity 365 days a year. Because the, the, the issue is people think of satellites as just there for disaster. No, we now have solutions that can reduce the digital divide. We have solutions that do satellite, that do a cellular backhaul. We have solutions that do fiber backup. We have solutions that connect schools, etc. We are, you know, part of a normal national uh, network, communication network. And unless you have satellite as part of that network, your network is not resilient. Let's be very clear, terrestrial asset are vulnerable like hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, to earthquakes. So unless a, com a country has satellite, and I mean equipment, as well as bandwidth that's paid for and reserved for that equipment. So unless you have those two elements together, you don't have a resilient communication network mm -hmm. because when disaster strikes and you've got some old equipment in the garage, you pull it out of the, the garage, but you don't have any bandwidth associated with that equipment. So you have to have the bandwidth and the equipment together. That for me is, is what we should be offering now. So there we go. Yeah, so it should be both, otherwise it's of no use. Yes. So keeping it in the garage, wherever it is the uh, immediate need, doesn't serve the purpose. That no. Is, uh, correct. Uh, and, and what is interesting is obviously satellite bandwidth could be used for e-government, for education, for any application for those 364 days. When disaster strikes for that one day, it gets swapped over to disaster relief. And only satellite technology would be able to do that. Yes, yeah, so you repurpose societal networks for preparedness and readiness in case of yes. a natural disaster. That's good. And James, if I may ask you, uh, many types of natural disasters physically compromise terrestrial networks and communications snap. How does satellite fill this void? Yeah, yes, thank you. And um, building on from Simon's comments, this is not a, this is not a void. It, this is really a place where satellite is your, your, your mainstay. Of your of your communications, it's not a it's not a backup or a failover. It's it's what you use as your primary communications bearer. Um, so, following on from my introductory comments, uh, a lot of the comments that I'll make now really relate to the program that we did in the in the Philippines. This was an international program with the governments of of the UK uh, and the Philippines that was set up and led by and led by Inmarsat. It was a multi year project, and it was focused on focused on disaster response. And um, again, following on Simon's point, we, we didn't originally go into the country thinking we were gonna set up a program focused on disaster response. Uh, we thought we were gonna have a conversation about how they could use satellite to improve resilience and connectivity for a, a, a suite of applications uh, across the piece. And we, we interviewed lots of people, chief executives of big corporations, um, governments, um, and, the, and, the, and, and the rest, meetings in hospitals, um, et cetera. And we identified a number of use cases but when we all boiled it down, um, the, the most important use case that the country was most committed to, interested in, had need for, was around disaster response. 
And, and Philippines, as we came to know through that journey, was a very knowledgeable satellite user, an experienced satellite user. They knew what they were using. They knew all the different systems. They knew regional systems. They knew global systems. Um, they actually even had emergency telecommunications uh, people on staff uh, within the within the government who were who were knowledgeable about different satellite systems and, and could could explain to you the differences and how they worked and how they and how they and how they didn't work. When we had our conversations and we started to figure out what the requirements were um, in the country, we we boiled them down to a, we boiled them down to a few and 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 more or less when you have a a rapid onset disaster and um, I, categorically, disasters tend to be broken up into two um, isomorphic different groups, either um, slow onset disasters such as famines uh, that you can see coming from some period away, or rapid onset disasters that have high qualities of unpredictability to them, uh, volcanoes, um, typhoons, um, earthquakes. The, the time to recover from the sudden shock of the rapid onset disaster drives the cost of, of recovery. So, so time is key. Uh, social breakdown happens very, very quickly. If people can't get access to money, can't get access to groceries, can't get access to, to information, um, there can be difficulties with, with, uh, with social control. The, the Philippines government at the time had also studied the impact of communications on disaster response efficacy in some detail uh, based on the Yolanda, the Haiyan um, typhoon, which at that point had been the, the, the strongest winds ever to hit landfall. In fact, maybe they were superseded by the, the very recent Goni um, uh, di disaster. So they had some idea about what the exposure was and that this was, this was a real requirement. And they had employed satellite communications technologies that used in Mossad began terminals and satellite phones um, in disaster response. In, in terms of the, the geographies, um, the Philippines specifics uh, had something to say about the role of telecommunications in disasters. They have many what they call JIDAs, uh, or Gidas, geographically isolated uh, missing islands, very difficult to deploy highly resilient telecommunications across all of those islands using, for example, fiber backhaul, et cetera, either physically impossible or, or economically um, un unfeasible. They've, the sorts of disasters that they tended to face, there was a lot of uncertainty about where they would land and what their impact would be. So you had a huge amount of area to cover. And in order to build a resilient digital um, solution, you needed to have something that could be flexibly deployed and putting in place fixed telecommunications networks just in case um, wouldn't meet that. But rapid deploy satellite communications, mobile satellite communications was something that worked um, very well for them. Uh, in, in terms of how they, how they started to, uh, uh, other issues around the, the use of telcos, um, I think it's important to say that telcos are not the enemy here. Um, telecom systems are not the enemy of satellite, and satellite is not the enemy of, um, of um, terrestrial telecommunication systems. The, the, the two tend to act in a very synergistic way, and they're both complements in terms of digital inclusivity. And we saw examples when we looked at um, uh, examples of how disasters have been responded to and how the citizenry and the first responders had acted in concert, that actually if you had um, access to some functioning terrestrial telecommunications network that could allow basic uh, communications on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever it would be with more resilient communications over satellite for the first responders, then you could have a powerful citizen engagement going on whilst your first responders were, were empowered with the, with the satellite piece that improved the efficacy, um, efficacy no, no end. So th there's the vulnerability of telcos um, you can't necessarily build them in a very resilient way, um, sufficient to, 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 to survive very strong winds. Um, wireless backhaul gets blown around, um, towers can be destroyed, the antennas on the towers can be destroyed. In fact, one of the um, preparatory conversations that we had was with a board member of um, a number of the telcos um, in the country who explained that one of their resilience strategies was when they, when they had um, a sense that there was going to be a, a typhoon from weather warnings, they would preemptively take down antennas from some towers in some of the areas that were likely to be affected so that they could put them back up shortly after um, without, them being, without them being damaged. So the telecom networks themselves would in some instances be decommissioned as a resilient strategy. That would leave a period of time um, when your, your only real communications um, medium was satellite, whether that's 24 or 48 or 72 hours, um, that period of time is crucial. 
In fact, we heard um, uh, uh, stories from the government of a small island being cut off for three whole weeks. Um, so through a loss of communication. it is like uh, satellite uh, connectivity complements along with telecom networks, which can be restored and brought back in the affected region, as well as you are getting <clears throat> to use societal networks and other ecosystem so that reconstruction rehab happens fast. That's, that's very correct. Absolutely. I mean, what, what you're trying to solve for is very rapid reconstruction, um, minimal damage during the, during the uh, immediate aftermath, uh, and maximum right. recovery, and ultimately business as usual. Oh, right. Thank you very much. And uh, let me remind here that uh, at this point, audience have already started posting questions. I'll go ahead with questions to my two other speakers, then take up the audience questions. But do put up more on Q&A and we'll definitely come on and uh, take, take them up. I once again appreciate Thuraya and express their sincere thanks for supporting us in doing this panel today. So, uh, Yasir, uh, Yasim, how the satellite industry will help transform the humanitarian system within the digital transformation of economy? Thank you, uh, Rian. Now, I think uh, whether due to war, uh, natural disaster, or, or pandemic, people uh, around the globe uh, have been forced to adapt new ways uh, of digital transformation and search for better life, basically. The need for necessities such as food or medical is mounting, while new advances in technology and digital technology in various sectors are beginning to offer transformational solutions uh, to, these, uh, to some of these challenges. Uh, in, the, in the current era of economic globalization and interconnectedness, the need for connectivity is growing, of course, uh, around the world, and economies now depend on reliable communications uh, to, do, to do their work, basically. Satellite communications are uh, increasingly related to global uh, digital economies transformation, and their benefits uh, spread across develop, uh, development sectors such as agriculture, uh, fisheries, health, uh, and education uh, sector. Uh, the satellite technologies can extend uh, the scope of digital transformation of an economy through offering the last mile connectivity and extend uh, these digital technologies uh, uh, to, to various economies and, and remote areas of the world. Like Simon mentioned earlier, uh, satellite technologies are, is not limited to disaster preparedness or disaster response or recovery. Uh, satellite technologies are used in, for different uh, use cases, uh, backhauling, offering uh, broadband connectivity, uh, backup to fiber, uh, uh, IoT and M2M uh, is, is, is another uh, technology that, that helps with the, actual, with the, with the, with the preparedness for, for, for disasters. Troya satellite uh, services and applications contribute to sustainable development in emerging economies, improving people's lives through various applications. Uh, one example is that uh, we've used the Thraya IP Plus portable broadband terminal uh, in connecting uh, World Vision last, mobile, uh, last Mile mobile solutions, which is designed to improve remote data uh, collection in refugee camps uh, or, or remote uh, villages. The, what the, what's referred to as LMMS offers better management of aid recipients, enables faster aid distribution, and uh, delivers rapid reporting to aid and relief agencies in the humanitarian uh, sector. I believe the, the satellite, uh, communication, uh, satellite communication has a big role to play within the connectivity domain and in extending the digital transformation 
uh, to the humanitarian uh, system. And the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think has shown that we've been able to act very uh, uh, actively, uh, become an active participant when it came to uh, extending the connectivity uh, to, uh, to the healthcare uh, sector, to the educational uh, sector. A number of initiatives uh, we have taken uh, in, the, in the UAE and outside the, the UAE. For example, uh, we've, we've supplied uh, uh, equipment, which is the Thraya X5 Touch, uh, and it has been used uh, with ambulances uh, in, the, in the UAE to enable them use their smart uh, phone applications. Uh, in Australia, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the police force, in order to maintain the vehicles within certain regions during the, the lockdown, uh, they used uh, the Thraya sat sleeve uh, because they were uh, they had their own uh, smartphone application. So they needed to have that connectivity in areas where the terrestrial uh, connectivity is not reliable or, or is not there. And, and the Thraya sat sleeve was very useful uh, for them. So not only because of the ability of SATCOM to, to, re to, remote, uh, to reach remote areas, but SATCOM is also important because of the uh, resiliency and the availability of SATCOM systems. And this is, I think, what also Simon mentioned earlier, that to have a complete resilient network, you need to have satellite communications as an integral part of, of that uh, network. Correct. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> Steve, if you can tell me, what are the pivotal space and ground-based communication requirements for disaster first responders. Um, having been on the ground on many disasters, you know, there are many different factors and facets you have to look at, right? Um, you know, the, the big thing is right away as a first responder, you want quick deploy voice and data access, right? So obviously you're gonna, fir you're first you're gonna try, look, I, I'm going to be honest here, as a, as a disaster responder, you're going to try your normal means of communications first, right? So you're going to try your land mobile radio, you're going to try your regular telephone, your cell phone, so on and so forth. But uh, if that doesn't work, then obviously now you need to step it up a notch, as, as the rest of my colleagues are saying on the, on the webinar here, is that, you know, you got to be able to quickly um, bring your services back online. So, you know, we're going to we're going to do that in two parts, um, both voice and data. So let's talk about voice connectivity for a minute. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, you have voice connectivity. I got it over satellite. Um, but uh, if you can't make that phone call into the regular public switch telephone network, who are you going to be able to call, right? So it's really important, I think, of having handheld sat phones um, as well as you know, it all depends on your requirement that you're trying to achieve, right? But you may have VoIP and your regular telephones tied to VSAT satellite terminals as well. So I think there's a there's a good mix there um, between uh, when you're talking voice communications uh, um, and the, the telephone network. A lot of times agencies and organizations, they're just worried about talking to themselves and not really worried about, you know, they need to call outside resources like for you know, to manage the logistics and things like that. Um, the other part that a lot of people don't really talk about is radio over IP. Um, and that's really one to many communications or to uh, uh, augment your current uh, land mobile radio system as a disaster responder and as a firefighter, I'll tell you, um, you know, you rely on that, on that two-way radio for your safety and security, as well as coordinating uh, um, the incident response. Many, many agencies and organizations involved in disaster do this um, and have this. And I think um, uh, it's what's great, Night Sky, where I'm at today, um, you know, Night Sky is, is really into building radio over IP systems and uh, solutions to be able to accomplish that uh, requirement. Um, but uh, to do that and then tie it to, to uh, satellite um, is, is tricky at best, um, and, uh, um, but i um, happy to be involved in that. Let's get along a little bit more to the data side, if you will. Um, tracking of personnel and equipment, 
uh, both for safety and loss prevention. I think that's really, really um, important when you're on the ground. Um, and then also GIS, uh, information systems uh, and imagery, as you started getting into mapping and drones and surveying, so you could do damage assessment, coordinate logistics and coordination and, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, I think what's, what's really important here is just being flexible um, as a uh, organization, uh, being flexible in that, you know, both the equipment and services that, uh, that you provide, um, uh, you know, can meet the need of the, of the disaster responder. Um, let me give you an example of that in Hurricane uh, uh, Maria, um, there was, they were doing food and aid drops via helicopter, okay? Uh, the US uh, military was. And what happened was uh, with these food and aid drops, they realized that there were markets nearby the food and aid drop uh, points that were full of food and water. Okay, and why? Why is that? Because they couldn't use their point of sale, their credit card or their debit card in order to buy food in the market. So what do you do? Do you open the doors and you just let everybody take what they need? No, obviously you can't do that, right? right. So you know, I raised my hand and said, hey, we, why don't we look at satellite? Because obviously what happened was the cellular and land and terrestrial based systems were down. So we use satellite, uh, small satellite terminals, um, almost in an IOT type environment to uh, build the, uh, to access their point of sale systems. And so they can open up the markets again to provide uh, uh, food and water to, you know, regular uh, people on the island. And what was interesting about it is, I mean, you know, it was much cheaper putting up these small little satellite terminals for point of sale than it was to fly around in a, you know, I ended up flying around in a Blackhawk for a few days, putting up all these terminals at large supermarkets, which that was something that I don't think anybody ever thought you would have to do, right, in a disaster, but it made sense. But what was also key to that was working with satellite companies that you know, we're, we're comfortable with you doing something that was totally not um, in the purview of that particular equipment uh, uh, to be used like that, both in bandwidth and equipment, but it worked, right? So it's important to be flexible in what you're trying to do. Um, the, the last thing in, in all this is preparedness. I think, um, you know, uh, some of my other colleagues brought this up too, is equipment and bandwidth. You know, you know is your equipment up to date? you know, is firmware up in it, um, so on and so forth. Do you have a, you know, bandwidth plan that's current? Have you paid for it? Um, and then let's not mention, you know, forget to mention the power systems involved. You could have all the greatest satellite equipment in the world, but if you don't have a generator or something that will power it, um, you're, you're kind of out of luck, right? And let's go one step further. And a lot of people forget this piece is that if you don't have, you know, your power systems in place, not only a generator, but uh, if the generator puts out dirty power, you're not going to power your satellite terminal there either. So, you know, it's, you know, making sure you've got good, uh, clean power and uh, systems in place, have your bandwidth plan current, have your equipment up to date, and, uh, and uh, to be able to, to get online quickly and, and efficiently. So, um, you know, as you know, there's many, many different kinds of satellite uh, equipment and services that are out there. Each one of them feels a, really a specific need, if you will. And uh, at Night Sky, we like saying we're device agnostic, if you will, um, because everybody is different. Everybody's requirements slightly different. And uh, we like to, uh, uh, to listen to your requirement and, uh, um, you know, and try to, try to meld the solution to fit that requirement. Thank you. Fine. So that covers the and addresses the resilient part also, how to be prepared and ready. We have been getting a lot of questions. And I'll start with the first question from Mr. Andrew. The cost of keeping satellite system as a backup is quite high. Is there an option to have bandwidth activated when it's required? Who would like to take it? James, can you? Can you talk on this? Yeah, certainly. But I, I think I, I have maybe a, a, an easier job because uh, in terms of the mobile satellite systems, satellite phones, et cetera, they're 
they're not very expensive. Simon would be the right person to address this. Um, so, so there, there are there are different sorts of satellite systems, and and some, you know, would 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 require a level of access to to um, to capacity to be made available and as a scarce resource, and others wouldn't. Mobile satellite systems can often be used in a tactical way, which is why satellite phones are often kept. Uh, the, the challenge actually there is making sure that you're keeping them refreshed so that the batteries aren't running out, the people who know how to use them um, are, are still around, et cetera. But typically the access to the capacity is not an issue. Perhaps Simon might be better placed to address the particular aspect of, of capacity um, availability, a comment that you made in your opening remarks. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, yes, no, satellite bandwidth. I think governments uh, and lots of organisations have an idea of satellite bandwidth prices pre-2010. Um, I don't think people are aware of how much work the satellite industry has done on a whole um, in reducing megabit prices so that it is virtually competitive with terrestrial pricing now. Uh, and again, we're not we don't compete, we're a complementary uh, technology to terrestrial. Um, and they people should look at the new pricing in Africa. Um, you can get monthly subscriptions starting at $15 a month um, across Sub-Saharan Africa, as an example. Um, you can get them starting in Europe again at $15 a month. Um, and, and also, you know, dedicated megabit prices are surprisingly affordable. And when you think that you can use that megabit anywhere within the, for example, in the Caribbean, you buy a megabit for the Caribbean, you can use it on any island. So any organization that spans the Caribbean can use that megabit either in Barbados or in the north in Jamaica uh, or in the south in Martinique, as an example. Um, and what other technology offers you that flexibility um, for regional solutions? So I think people need to really investigate the pricing because they'd be surprised. Um, and also terminal prices have come down a huge amount um, and the terminal capability in, in, in broadband supplies has come down, has, has increased a huge amount. You know, we have terminals that are capable of physically capable of downloading hundred megabits and uploading 10, 20 megabits and they cost under $400 or under $300. So the idea that satellite is expensive, I think is people need to investigate the solutions now. Would be I think answer. that's an old notion now. That's an old notion now. And uh, this also puts us in a question for you, pointedly, uh, it's an anonymous uh, question. Does crisis connectivity charter fully coordinate the satellite bandwidth with good with ground equipment terminals deployment. Yes, absolutely. The the um, the uh, satellite fleets or or whoever is donating donating the equipment, it's specifically designed to work with the bandwidth that uh, fleet operator is donating. So there is no issue at all. The the fleet operator gives the the ETC the coverage. Um, and there's the equipment that will work inside that coverage. And then the ETC chooses whichever equipment is most suitable. So yes, um, you know, and, and, and let's be very clear, as everybody said, buying a bit of metal and sticking it in a garage is not gonna help, okay? However expensive that bit of metal or carbon fiber is, unless it's linked to a satellite and unless you're paying for that connectivity, you don't have resilient telecommunications, true, okay? True. It's those two steps together that governments and agencies don't seem to yet grasp, I think. Right, and uh, there's another question from Mr. Tariq. How, satellite, uh, how satellites are affordable solutions is productive, useful for agriculture in remote areas? I think, uh, Nasser, you can take it. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Sure. So uh, let, let me try to, to give a few points on how this is uh, relevant to the, to the satellite uh, and the benefits of satellite communication. So satellites provide ubiquitous uh, coverage, you know, and, and that, that helps in covering vast areas. 
so you would not be limited to, to a specific area. And of course, remote areas are, are, are covered with, with the satellite communication systems. But there is uh, also the benefit about uh, the interoperability. So the, there, there are technologies used on the ground today, uh, the, the LP1 technology, the low power wide area network technologies, which are used for sectors like the smart uh, agriculture and the interoperability that is provided by mobile satellite systems enables uh, a sector like smart agriculture to use LP1 technologies and be able to analyze the data from a farm uh, or a site uh, and get all the telemetry, all the data and, and analyze it at a, at a, at a headquarter or, or a data center, where the, wherever is the, is the data center. But satellites are very good uh, in terms of the IoT uh, technology because uh, they provide ample capacity uh, and that is a factor of the space segment and also the ground segment. So there are technologies used on the, on the ground segment that are capable of supporting millions of devices uh, for uh, IoT. Uh, and last, I would say, is the, is the adaptability and the configurability of the payload, especially when it comes to the, uh, uh, the uh, advanced mobile satellite uh, systems like, like Thoraya. Uh, that allows us to offer multiple technologies and adapt to multiple technologies from the ground. So we're not limited to, to one technology platform, I would say, or one sort of air interface. Uh, so one thing is that we can support multiple technologies uh, from, the, from the satellite perspective, but also we have the capability of uh, changing the satellite configuration while in orbit to meet different uh, requirements. When it comes to the smart agriculture uh, sector, uh, the use cases for mobile satellite services, uh, specifically for IoT and this sector, is in terms of monitoring of crop fields, uh, maximizing yield, uh, controlled use of, of pesticides, uh, smart irrigation. Uh, one relevant uh, sort of use case is also managing uh, the uh, live uh, livestock. So for example, for the controlled use of pesticides, I think there are some regulations in different parts of the world about how pesticides are spray sprayed on the farms and they need to be within certain accuracy. Uh, and, and that is uh, something that is supported uh, by uh, satellite systems in terms of making sure the uh, GPS is augmented uh, to achieve that uh, accuracy level uh, that is uh, part, of the, part of the regulations. Uh, and, and some parts of the world now they're trying to do the uh, pesticides uh, spraying through the use of drones, uh, which requires sort of beyond uh, line of sight. Uh, and there are also some regulations in some parts of the world uh, related to uh, uh, doing the uh, spraying the pesticides at night rather than during daytime. And satellite connectivity uh, allows that uh, beyond line of sight communication and uh, controlling the, the drones uh, for that uh, activity. So, so these are some of the use cases that are relevant uh, to uh, satellite communications and the smart uh, agriculture uh, vertical or sector, I would say. Thank you very much. And for nonprofit, which often do not have the budget to consistently upgrade their satellite ground systems, what equipments do you recommend they purchase if they deploy people following disasters. The equipment should be lightweight, easily set up, reliable in harsh environment and able to operate when electrical grid is offline. Probably Steve can take this uh, question. It's from an anonymous uh, question being asked. So Steve, yeah. can you focus on the ground systems? Thank you, uh, Riaz. Yeah, you know this is a tough. It's this is a tough deal. Um, I've worked for many nonprofits, some very large international NGOs, as well as uh, the smaller ones too. And uh, you're right. You know, funding is is obviously the factor here. But uh, you know, something like this. You know, I think safety and security and and to coordinate logistics um, for their people on the ground. I think you know very simply having a uh, a satellite phone or a, uh, or a BGAN terminal or something like that, uh, a, a small 
uh, type of device um, uh, would probably be the best thing for them. I think having a handheld satellite phone um, would be really good because they can keep in touch with, uh, <clears throat> with their people on the ground and, uh, and then having a BGAN or, or even a, a small, very small portable VSAT terminal um, like a, uh, you know, that, that uh, is already, you know, online and connected. The problem is, is as you, uh, as a lot of people indicated already is you got to have the bandwidth and everything uh, available. Um, if you do something like a BGAN type terminal, then you can just buy simply buy minutes for that uh, uh, terminal as well. So I think that, you know, again, just having a very simple uh, handheld SAP phone and maybe a small BGAN terminal just to uh, keep your uh, uh, keep your folks safe and uh, and also uh, manage logistics, I think is is a start. Well, thank you. And there's a question from, uh, sorry, uh, Jasim, you need to add something? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, to add to what Steve said. Uh, I think that because the question was related to uh, nonprofits with limited budget and the change of equipment. So I just wanted to add that we, we still have equipment on the ground that is used the, and that was deployed since 2001. And the customers didn't need to, to, to change the equipment. And MSS terminals are, are sort of uh, low, low in cost and uh, very light and easy to use. And today we have terminals that basically uh, are allowing you to bring your own device. So you don't need to even uh, use uh, a dedicated satellite terminal, but sort of an adapter or a sleeve where you can enable an iPhone or a different smartphone to, to, to connect with that. So uh, allowing you that, that connectivity. And for, for nonprofits, I mean, uh, like m the other panelists mentioned today, all of us uh, in our companies, we have uh, arrangements and agreements with the nonprofits uh, and the uh, non-governmental organizations to, to provide them terminals at, at uh, free of cost and uh, discounted airtime rates. And sometimes we also uh, do provide uh, or swap the old terminals with the, for them with, with, with new terminals. Oh, that's wonderful. And there's a question from Shubham Desai, who says, how early warning satellite-based Earth observation system helps HADR frontiers to mitigate challenges in a disaster situation? Who would like to take this? Sure, Simon, go ahead. Um, I, I think Earth observation is, is crucial. It's certainly a technology that needs to be integrated into any early warning system. Um, also, the use of drones, tethered drones, etc., males and hail types of drones. Um, there needs to be a facility or, or a satellite connectivity for HD streaming for search and rescue. Um, and also, Eutelsat is launching a, a small fleet of nanosatellites for at a very low orbit so that we can have um, IoT sensors for the very low uh, link budget requirement or power requirement, so very low cost. So once you start getting into that kind of connectivity where your, your, your network is not reliant on, is not terrestrial, at that point your early, your, your monitoring is therefore not reliant on terrestrial, which is vulnerable to, to earthquakes, et cetera. And secondly, your early warning is not vulnerable to terrestrial uh, issues such as, as tsunamis, et cetera, because there's been a number of, of number of instances where you, know, you may have a monitoring network that's run by cellular, then the earthquake happens, the cellular network is knocked out and there's no early warning for the tsunami. You know, so that you need to think about integrating all of these networks and making them as resilient as possible. And I think satellites, certainly with IoT, will provide an element of that from now on. Well, that, that's true. And that gives me a, a quick reminder that uh, US government has a very interesting program called Pacific Endeavor. It's a multinational communication interoperability program wherein 20 to 25 militaries from different nations come together for a joint military exercise in which they only talk about interoperability and saving lives for a humanitarian cause. 
So that, that again reinforces how interoperability is so important between different technologies in, within the satellite domain and along with terrestrial and uh, other connectivity. So here is a question from Adrian. Sorry, James, please go on. Uh, yes, I, mean, I think we, we shouldn't forget the people here as well. So when we're thinking about interoperability, of course, people are using these systems. And one of the mega trends that we've seen in satellite communications over the past decade or so is that they've become much easier to use. Um, there's been a general trend in system engineering and, uh, and, 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 and design um, thinking around satellite systems. They should be easier to use. Um, they shouldn't be uh, dependent on two or three highly specialist engineers who might not be in your region or nearby in order to customize and set them up. They should be um, more, more intuitive and have standard interfaces um, at, the, at the front end. And, and that interoperability isn't just at the technical layer, it is also at the human layer. And one of the things that we've seen extensively is that when uh, government users or NGOs want to deploy um, satellite systems, it's very important for them to, to know about how the training works, how they can refresh that, whether they can get service, um, and all of, all of those factors. And that really goes into their decision as to whether or not they use these things or whether when they buy them, they keep them in a box, having tried them once in the training exercise and it being too hard, or whether they found that they were intuitive to use and simple, and they could be rolled out every time. Right. And uh, as you rightly say, nowadays, ease of operation and uh, leveraging social media is also very important for saving lives. And what happens is, once you have a satellite spot, then you create a small network within, within the region so that po affect, affected population can reach back through social media and other connectivity once you enable it. So th that's what is correct. Now, uh, there's a question from Mr. Adrian. Can Steve or anyone comment on the secondary matters beyond the initial response and how the SATCOM community can best support impacted areas. Steve, can you take it? Um, trying to understand this, uh, I, I read this just a second ago, and and uh, um, I think that you know the SATCOM community, and maybe it just goes to James. Don't forget about you know the people, right? Not only the people operating the equipment and involved, or the responders on the ground. But you know the impacted area itself. I think that uh, um, you know. Let's actually back up one to the uh, to the whole GIS and and uh, surveying and all that with drones and so on and so forth. I think that you know having uh, uh, the having pictures uh, of of the Earth or the impacted area of the disaster area prior to the disaster they hit. And then be able to overlay that with um, um, with uh, current photos uh, in GIS of the disaster, the impacted area would really help tremendously with um, disaster assessment and seeing what's you know uh, damage assessment, and see what's uh, what's been affected and what isn't, and kind of you know using some of the the latest um, surveying and mapping and GIS imagery uh, uh, software and and systems that are out there. I think. Um, uh, you know, as well suited for for trying to to help out the community in a in a very large way. Um, also, maybe bringing in very large um, uh, VSAT terminals with uh, telephony capabilities, so people the affected area can actually use that technology to call home, for instance, and you know say that I'm okay and call their loved ones and so on and so forth. Uh, kind of like a a very large phone booth, if you will. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, a lot of times we forget about the people itself. Thanks, Steve. And I think, uh, although we, we, we did cover some grounds, it's like scratching the surface and this can go on for a long time. So I think we should go in for another panel very soon. But uh, looking at the clock, I would like to close this session and thank everyone, our eminent expert speakers, global audience, and Thuraya, our key supporter and enabler. Recording of this session will be available soon on the GBF website. A couple of questions still remained unanswered, and we will post it in writing next to the video. For future GBF webinars, 
please do visit gbf.org. The next web webinar is Airborne Again, the Future Post-Pandemic Mobility Horizon on 19th November at 3 p.m. UK time. However, GBF uh, SAT Expo of CAPSAT is in virtual format this year and which is starting next week. So don't do register and tune in. Registrations are open. Until then, goodbye and say stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>